name is Bjarke Sorensen, I'm, I'm from Denmark, um, and I'm going to tell you about the PhD study that I've been doing, and um, uh, that was the reason why I, have been, uh, I met Samara and uh, Jeff, and have been working with emergency obstetric care with them for the last years. Uh, it's a big honor to be here at Duke University, and it's been one of the best things in my life ever to meet those two guys and uh, to work together with the, the Duke program that I think is really, really doing a difference, making a difference. Uh, I have to apologize ahead that my English is not very good, but you could, I hope you will just like be amused by my accent and my <laughs> mixing up words, but um, if you are annoyed, please don't throw hard, solid things at me. It's you should hear some of the accents down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but I'm going to talk about maternal health and uh, the problem of maternal mortality that, that women die while they're pregnant and giving birth. Uh, and do you work, some of you, with maternal uh, health, or is it, uh, yeah, all of you maybe are? No, some of you. Um, well, but that's great because then I could maybe get some support if I'm kind of stuck with <laughs> words or terms or whatever. Um, my PhD study was at the University of Copenhagen, uh, and I did that between 2007 and 2010. And uh, it's got a title, it's, yeah, all the titles are usually quite boring, but it's uh, called Strategies to Improve the Quality of Emergency Obstetric Care User and Provider Perspectives in a Tanzanian Setting. Um, I'll give you a bit of a background for how it all started because my study actually changed its focus uh, after my first field study in Tanzania um, because I realized that the way I was heading was uh, not the right way if I wanted to explore ways to improve maternal health. Um, and then, s so, but just briefly, it might be too basic for you to, it's kind of insulting, I don't hope that, but the background for uh, is that maternal mortality is a very big health concern. The lifetime risk of dying from uh, pregnancy or giving birth is 1,000 times higher if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa compared to Denmark. This is me and my wife and my two daughters. You have a very little risk of dying in maternal death if you live in, in one of the affluent countries, but if you live in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's uh, one of the main causes of uh, death in the reproductive age. So um, so poverty, of course, has something to do with this, an issue about uh, affluent and, and poor countries. But um, like, and if you see where the maternal mortality is highest, it's definitely Sub-Saharan Africa. A few countries of Southeast Asia would be like Afghanistan, the, the Nepal, have quite high maternal mortalities as well. Go to the Americas, it'll, uh, it's much lower than maternal mortality. Um, so, I don't know if you must have heard about this MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. Okay, at the Grand Hall, nobody knew about the MDGs. I think it's like mm -hmm. some, uh, but uh, those of us who work with global health, it's like, uh, so you know the, the MDG number five, one of the eight MDGs is to improve maternal health. And uh, basically, uh, the aim is to reduce maternal mortality by 75% between 1990 and 2015. And the strategy to do that was to have 90% of all births to be attended by a skilled birth attendant, a midwife, or a doctor. And um, that is because um, the, the experience is that, uh, for example, antenatal care, you could find women at high risk like for having uh, complications. But still, it's the, the discussion of screening is that uh, Actually, very few screening programs work, and the screening program for maternal risk is is not good enough. So you would usually only identify a few of those women having complications. So most of those women uh, dying from giving birth and from pregnancy would be low-risk women that would not be identified ahead. Uh, so the, this experience is that all women, high or low risk, should be um, giving birth with a skilled attendant. Um, and if you look at the trends worldwide, uh, until a few years back, nobody actually meant that there was any improvement in maternal mm -hmm. mortality worldwide, despite 30 years of putting it high on the political agenda. Uh, but last year, there was a report from the WHO and UN, and also a paper in The Lancet by uh, some people from the University of yeah, Washington. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
uh, that said that now there actually is a sign of an improvement in maternal mortality that we have made probably have re reduced maternal mortality by 30, 40 percent uh, worldwide. But it's very difficult to measure maternal mortality. Uh, so it's uh, there are so it's actually very difficult to say something because the registration is poor and the statistical methods are uh, rough estimates. But it seems as we're moving the right direction. But until one year ago, if everybody was just like NDG5, that's bad karma. It's not gonna. We're never gonna meet it. Um, but. But the discussion has also <laughs> been because uh, one thing is to have 90% of old women to give birth with a so-called skilled attendant. But we have seen actually in countries where they increased the number of skilled attended births, that maternal mortality was increasing as well. So there's no evidence that alone giving birth with a skilled attendant is will reduce maternal mortality. We have to look into not only the 90%, but also the skills of the attendants and what and they also the enabling environment. If they work at a place, they have no drugs, they have no ambulance, they have nothing. It's difficult to, to save the lives of mothers. But what has been like um, stressed by the UN and by people working in this field is that the basic skills to save the mother's lives is the so-called emergency obstetric care, mm -hmm. signal functions. And that is, you have to be able to deal with the main causes of maternal mortality. You have to be able to treat the PPH, that means postpartum hemorrhage, uh, that's the main cause of maternal mortality worldwide, that the woman is bleeding excessively after the birth. It must be able to treat infections, eclampsia, you know, the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Uh, you have to be able to remove a placenta that is not coming out because it could cause severe bleeding and infection. We must also be able to, to, to perform evacuation of the uterus if you have uh, complications to abortion. That is the second cause of maternal mortality is uh, septic abortion, that you have illegal uh, abortion. If you go to Latin America, the main cause of maternal mortality would be, in many countries, is uh, complications to abortion. Um, and the post-abortion care is very important, that you, you need to clean up the uterus immediately. Um, and you also need to be able to perform a vacuum delivery, that is, that you put a vacuum cup on the head of the baby if it's not coming out, to help the baby come out in places where you don't yeah, and also sometimes you know, even in places where you do cesarean sections. Um, but these emergency obstetric care skills has been like uh, repeatedly mentioned as central skills in, um, for any midwife and, and doctor dealing with the childbirth to do. Um, the, the kind of theoretical framework for discussing delays in emergency obstetric care when women they die or have uh, or have severe complications is the so-called three delays model that was uh, proposed in 15 years ago in social science and medicine by Deborah Main and Thaddeus. Um, and uh, they analyzed the different delays, the women uh, that could, the, the delays that could d delay the woman from, from having emergency obstetric care in time. First delay is community delay, that there is something in the, the uh, woman does not recognize the need to go to the health facility, you don't want to go, or the husband doesn't want her to go or they don't have money. Second delays uh, is like the transport delays, means the delay in reaching the health facility. Uh, that also, of course, has something to do, to do with the distance to the health facility. And third delay is the delay once uh, at the health facility that sometimes uh, care is delayed, even in this uh, setting. Um, and But I was in, to begin with, when I started doing my PhD, I was interested in community delays. I did some qualitative uh, this, uh, master in, in Peru some years back and uh, I was doing like interviews with women that uh, gave birth and, and uh, I was wanting to, to expand on that uh, but just in, uh, in Tanzania that is one of the countries where uh, that has the highest number of maternal deaths worldwide. Um, but my idea was, and this, this is like the, the perspective that changed during the study, I wanted to, to, to look at factors that influenced the acceptance of mater maternal health services. Why was it that so many women gave birth at home and did not want to go to the health facilities? I did that by observations of um, births. Uh, I wanted to do observations of home births and births at small health facilities in a village setting and uh, also at a referral hospital. And then I did qualitative interviews with the women and her family and uh, health providers involved afterwards to kind of find out. Uh, it was like a very broad uh, approach. And then I was 
the idea was to be guided by this, the find initial findings on which way to go later on. Yeah, as mentioned, the, the study was in Tanzania, one of the top 10 countries uh, regarding absolute numbers of maternal uh, deaths. And I went to the far northwestern corner of the country, close to the Victoria Lake. Uh, if you have heard about where Jeff and Sumera and uh, the other Duke people, they work at close to the uh, Kilimanjaro, the Christian Medical Center at the, up in the highlands of Moshi. So it's uh, a little bit distance uh, up there. Um, this is how it looks like up at the lake. It's people live like not in even villages. They live scattered around uh, in small houses. We're surrounded by shambles and most people are like uh, doing subsistence farming and a little bit of cash cropping. Um, this is like a traditional house. This is a woman that gave birth at home. Uh, it was actually quite difficult to get uh, traditional birth. This is a traditional birth attendant. It was difficult to get to uh, be involved in those home births, so I actually only managed to see one because uh, of different reasons. One is that most traditional birth attendants are illiterate, and I wanted them to kind of call me on the cell phone when they had a woman in labor. And they didn't know how to use the cell phone, and there were no coverage in the places they, they worked. And they only had few deliveries, maybe 10 or 20 a year. So it was, uh, but I found one that was really good at, uh, at, uh, at cooperation and uh, but the other thing is that the kind of the health authorities uh, instituted a so-called law that it was prohibited to give birth at home. Women who gave birth at home could not have their children vaccinated unless they paid a fine. I thought it was a real law, but it turned out to be just something they invented themselves and they put the money in their pockets. But it was very difficult because it took traditional birth attendants to jail. Uh, so it was uh, quite uh, an ethical dilemma also working in this, in this setting. But um, but I stayed like uh, several nights at this place, and, um, and then I also observed uh, births at the health uh, facilities in the in the village. I don't know if you can see. This is very a very dark room, and the woman who is in labor here, she's giving birth, and this is the midwife. Uh, the woman had to bring like half a Coca-Cola bottle of kerosene to have the kerosene lamp on. And um, lots of mosquitoes there. I got malaria twice uh, sleeping in these um, uh, set, uh, these health facilities, and um, actually it turned out that they had very little possibility of managing com any complications. It was very basic what they were able to do. Um, so I had this idea. I wanted to know what everybody thought. What what was a good birth in Denmark? It would be something like oh I, yeah. A water birth, or all my parents and the doulas being around, and uh, maybe some whale singing, or I don't know. <laughs> but it's like so this kind of new age things. Uh, it's okay. Um, but in Africa, it was totally different. It was like just survival would be a good birth, the mother and child to survive. So, uh, so everybody knew it was dangerous. Everybody knew somebody who had a loss of a, a relative or a, a newborn, and actually they agreed. <coughs> the birth should take place at a health facility. They did not think it was better to give birth at home <coughs> um, because they knew it was safer at the health facility, even if it was like <coughs> they might not knew that the doctors there or uh, uh, they were talked to in a, in a kind of bad language sometimes. It was they preferred to be there because it was safer or they recognized it as a safer place. So they agreed on that. That was a good starting point. but. Um, Discussing the barriers to good maternal health care, uh, actually the so-called skilled attendants, the midwives and the doctors uh, working in the setting uh, said something uh, different from the, the, the uses of the health facilities. They complained the women that came so late for antenatal care and they came late for delivery and they said they are ignorant, they don't know what is good for them, so they don't know that it's dangerous or they're negligent, they don't care. Um, if they die, or, uh, there are these gender issues. The husbands usually don't want them to, to, to go out, and uh, all those cultural issues, that, that is the, the main barriers to good maternal health care. So they looked into community barriers. They did not kind of look into the barriers within the health system, even though, as you saw, the, the health facility was not really equipped to perform safe uh, births. The women and the families and the traditional birth attendants, those from the community, said that economy was the main barrier. It's free to give birth in Tanzania. 
but uh, still they said that there are indirect costs you have to bring the basin and this number of kangas or clothes and you have to pay uh, the bus fare and uh, the food it was low cost but still it was people living in substance in the economy they might not have any cash at all so it was a barrier and that has been repeatedly shown in other studies that that is the main barrier when it comes to uh, attending health facilities transport was a problem especially after they went if they gave birth uh, at the small health facility in the village and some complication happened there was nothing they could do about it the women knew that so they had to get some transport to go to the referral hospital in the capital, regional capital of Bukova and that was sometimes costly and unavailable uh, so transport was a big issue and they knew that there was a lack of staff so that midnight they might not be attended when they came to the health facility the door would be locked midwives sleeping and there's some people complain of like bad language but that was not a main issue mainly it was economy and then uh, yeah and then uh, what I, s I did it like an assessment of those uh, health like nine health facilities in, a, in, a, uh, in this area where I did my field work none of those health facilities were able to perform emergency obstetric care uh, staff were working under extremely hard conditions it was like one or two people having to work 24 7 and uh, actually I think kind of left behind uh, by the, the their the superiors or the health administrator administrators and they were I think they were kind really caring for the women but uh, what I also saw that there were some basic like skills from especially for, uh, for managing complications that were not really okay how do you start a bleeding how would you do if you had a bleeding from your wrist you would just compress and that's the same you do if you have a bleeding from the uterus after birth you do what you call bimanual compression very basic things uh, giving basic drugs and uh, like antibiotics it was uh, there was not much agreement on, on what to do um, and then I went also to this regional hospital in the regional capital Bukoba that's a referral hospital for the whole region there are 14 hospitals this is the main hospital and I just this was where the women they had to go if they had complications uh, actually it turned out that all those women in my uh, I interviewed 31 women and all of those who had complications ended up at a health facility most of them at the hospital so it was actually they made it to the hospital uh, but I used it like as a, I had to observe some some, uh, some women there uh, just as uh, control was my idea in the beginning but I had not been it was not on uh, I think I was doing my second interview there after a few days and then the first maternal death happened uh, I just heard the screaming of uh, the relative screaming outside and this is how it sounds like <laughs> Actually, I was there like four weeks uh, doing observations and interviews and uh, this hospital with like 4,000 deliveries a year, I personally uh, observed or was involved in uh, five maternal deaths. That is more than happened in the whole Denmark in, in a whole year. And all of those deaths were easily preventable. It was like, uh, and they had the possibility that they had a blood bank, they had theater, but it was like, uh, yeah, deaths from bleeding that should have been stopped. And when I arrived, it was just the mother was half dead. None of the equipment worked when we did uh, resuscitation. It was there were so many kind of things that were not working well. And uh, at that time, I was starting to think it is not right to continue to look into community factors because these women they actually want to come to the health facilities. They they find their ways by all means. Uh, bleeding on a public bus two hours, they get to this hospital and then the, the care is, is delayed and that's why that's when they die it was not fair uh, to continue looking into community delays blaming the women for dying it was time to, to shift my focus a bit so I kind of uh, wanted to look into the maternal death that happened at this hospital so I did like a, a maternal death review 
based on the hospital statistics, uh, they see that maternal mortality had increased uh, since last time uh, staff had skills training in emergency obstetric care. In 2006, they introduced a maternal death only. That means that every time a maternal death happens, uh, people would sit down and discuss what happened, what, how it could be improved so this does not happen again. But even though they introduced this kind of quality assurance measure, maternal mortality was increasing. I showed this to the uh, medical officer in charge of the hospital and said, is this okay? This is not, you're not on, on course to meet uh, MDG number five to reduce maternal mortality by 25% or by 75%. But he just said, no, we don't have a problem. This is a hospital. I mean, there's nothing to improve here. We could help any women. But the reason why women die is because they come late and they're ignorant and they're negligent. Um, so I wanted to look into a little further into that. So I kind of collected case files and other information uh, of all the maternal deaths that happened in a three years period. This is, took me three days to work through these piles of uh, uh, case files. And uh, I did interviews with staff involved in, in the maternal deaths. I managed to kind of collect sufficient information for a kind of a review of 62 out of 68 maternal deaths at the hospital. It turned out that the main causes were for dying were well known. Like they died from infections, complications to abortion, bleeding after birth, uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, obstructed labor, and some other. Um, and um, I did like a summary of all the cases and sent them for an external review by some uh, uh, consultants in OBGYN, um, and Tanzanian. Um, I also, I, I had sent to some Danish uh, OBGYNs, but I, it, the Tanzanian uh, review was that at least uh, around three in four of those deaths definitely should have been avoided at this hospital with the possibilities available there. So uh, that means major substandard care. The woman would probably have been alive if she had received uh, relevant uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. Half of the women uh, that died had been admitted that the hospital are uh, diagnosed with a complication for more than two days. So it was not right when the staff said that women come in late, we have no chance to save them because they come in, they die after five minutes. Most of them were there several days. And it was like basic skills that were was missing. They did not know how to stop a bleeding to do aortic compression or to use the drugs, we, you know, could uh, make the uterus contract and stop the bleeding. Uh, Post-abortion care was like, it was like uh, people who had illegal abortions were like, they had a written on the case file, criminal abortion, and then they were just left. They did not have the ev evacuation of the uterus done in 14 out of 17 cases, and then you die. You need to clean up the uterus. It's like a, having an abscess. You, you could give any amount of antibiotics. It does not safely get the, the woman through a septic abortion. And, um, yeah, it, it, infection like uh, most of the women who had sepsis did not receive three course antibiotics. Very basic things. And that was kind of because sometimes when you're in this setting, you despair and say, oh, it is so complex, there's so many things that, that so they don't have resources, it's impossible to change these things. But actually, um, I found there were some kind of low hanging fruits we could uh, improve on pretty fast, and that was like improving the skills and knowledge of the health providers. And um, yeah, just to it's a small comment on the ex we did the external confidential inquiry ex inspired by the the CMAC, the confidential inquiry into maternal death that we've been doing in the UK for 60 years now, uh, and we compared it to this maternal death audit that was already performed three uh, during three years at the hospital, like that the staff were kind of evaluating themselves. And the external audit, uh, the external inquiry was kind of almost, the odds ratio of identifying substandard care was almost six times higher. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it was, that's a, another discussion, but um, yeah, no, I'm just um, back a little bit to this delay model. This was how, where I started. I wanted to look into delays in the community in deciding to, to seek, uh, to seek uh, medical assistance. This was also what the health providers in the setting and the health administrators said. This is where we should really do something. We have to, f to fight the community. We have to attack them. That is what they said. That is what they meant when they find the women giving birth at home. 
to the TBAs to the uh, to the jail. The women uh, and the, their families they said no. The problem is the delay in getting the right treatment once we are at the health facility, and it's also a problem getting to the health facility because we know that the health facilities in the villages are not providing. Uh, um, emergency obstetric care. We have to go from there to the hospital in, in the uh, regional capital, Bukova. And I actually think what they said that makes more sense than the. Um, um, I think it's a question about should we move the women or should we move the, the, the health care? And I think after my initial uh, field study, that I think it was more fair to try and improve the health facility uh, care. and maybe even uh, move it closer to where women they give birth to the village health facilities. So my conclusion was the mothers in this field, they die because of facility delays, not primarily from community delays. Actually, this Millennium Development Goal number five was by the health professionals translated into placing responsibility for maternal deaths in the community. I don't think that was fair. I think you should focus on the skills rather than the 90% uh, birth at the health facility. I had the, the study I did in Peru was actually a bit of the same. That the doctor working in, the, in this village, um, he had to get a promotion to get to live closer where his family uh, lived. He had to have 90% of birth at uh, uh, his health facility. He had no running water, no electricity, no drugs, no nothing. The women didn't want to come there. But it, this was an area where the shining path has been operating, so he had a lot of soldiers present in, in this village. So he just went with the soldiers to get the women into the health facility when he heard they were at labor. So this is another way of um, yeah, indirect violence of the, the health system. And how the good intentions of the MDG-5 could be translated wrongly in, in local setting into what is not really uh, right. So I had to come up with something else, and I thought I was on this do you know this advanced life support in obstetrics? It's like the ATLS or ACLS. Uh, it's a two days uh, emergency obstetric care course. It's the most widely taught uh, EMOC course in the world by 100, 120,000 providers have attended the course. Um, and I was on this course in, in Glasgow uh, some years before in, uh, in Scotland. It was totally impossible for me to understand what they said. But uh, I had read the book and I, had, I thought found it very uh, useful when I got back to hospital to work with these emergencies because it was very structured and I really they kind of brainwashed me to know how to uh, what to do and I thought why not bring this to Tanzania and now it starts getting to there where I meet the um, Sumera and Jeff um, but uh, I called the U.S. headquarters and they said yeah go ahead start up also in, in Tanzania I had like half a year to find a to kind of figure out how to do it and what kind of study I would do. But I had like limited funding, but uh, so I wanted to do like a very simple setup. I wanted to do an observational intervention study. It was non, with, with no control, but it was like what was possible for me in the setting. And I would train all the staff that was uh, involved in childbirth at the regional hospital. Uh, and then I would assess clinical outcomes before and after in a prospective um, in, uh, observational study. Well, a lot of preparation, I was like half dead and just thinking this is never, never, ever going to work out. I had to get funding and permission from Ministry of Health and permits and how to find out how to do this clinical assessment. And you can hear I'm a whiny head. It's just like, <laughs> no, I felt very sorry for myself. It was, and try to find out what course, we sh uh, what the course content should be because we had to adapt the course. We couldn't teach the same thing that we teach in the U.S. and Denmark uh, as we were teaching in, in, in Tanzania. It was a different, um, different problems people were facing. Also had to find some instructors to do the training. So uh, I went to to UK to become an instructor myself. And um, yeah, for the data collection, this is just part of the data. We collected the bleeding after birth. A uh, very simple method by using an absorbent drape just after delivery. We, we collected all the blood. And um, on this absorbent drape, and I had to bring the absorbent drapes from Nairobi because it's very difficult to get these uh, in, in Africa. And I brought them on the bus, like 1,500 absorbent drapes. And the customers was just like, <laughs> are you pervert? Or, and I had to bribe them extra to get this uh, across the border to Tanzania. And uh, then we waited after one hour, and we could find out. It's a very simple method 
to find out the postpartum hemorrhage uh, amount. It was a method that was used for a misoprostol study in Guinea Bissau. So it was kind of approved by BMJ Journal, and uh, that's what we did. And we collected some other uh, data as well. I had to go through the whole literature of this also manual and write up compared to Tanzanian guidelines. And then find out the course. We wanted to do a course with very few lectures and much hands on training. And this topic should be relevant to the setting. We wanted to teach the basic signal functions of emergency uh, obstetric care to treat postpartum hemorrhage, infections, uh, eclampsia, uh, etc. And then, of course, also to neonatal resuscitation. It's so obvious, of course, you should be able to, to resuscitate a, a newborn that is not uh, um, able to to breathe by itself. Um, but that was quite different from what the, the courses, I, I went to Kenya and Rwanda to, to do with those courses, but they did like totally US kind of uh, uh, courses with a, a no uh, PPH workshop and uh, teaching complicated things like continuous electronic field monitoring. And uh, I could not, I had to change my mind because I could not use the kind of courses they, they did there. So I kind of, then I had to get some people from Malawi that I knew had been doing revision of the whole material to, to attend. Uh, and we put a program together with a few lectures and more workstations. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of that later on. The workstations addressing the main uh, complications of, uh, of childbirth. And some case discussions where it was not possible to do like role plays and things like that. And then the miracle happened. I was like on the edge of, uh, yeah, just in deep depression, I think it was. Uh, but then Jeff and uh, uh, Grant flew in over the lake in a small, very dangerous little plane <laughs> and came to the rescue because Jeff and Sumera were the uh, saving angels that came down from, from Duke and uh, <laughs> were uh, going to work uh, to stay like two or three years at the, in Moshi at KCMC and they wanted to do also as well. So it was just like um, after yeah a long walk uphill, it was just suddenly things started to change. And then we got the, uh, also uh, Malawi, Dr. Uwe Graf, who is like from Germany, but uh, hates being in Germany, so he's residing in Malawi, and he, he called me like some time ago and said it was the happiest moment of his life because he just found out he was never going back to Germany. <laughs> so he considered himself <laughs> Malawian. Um, he's a nice guy. And uh, Lina Ponda was a midwife from Malawi as well. And I had met Uwe uh, before in Savannah uh, briefly, but uh, otherwise I did not know the rest of the group. But it turned out to be a fantastic week when we do, did this um, um, teaching. And if I should mention five highlights of my life, it would, would be like maybe my marriage and my divorce. No, not my divorce, but <laughs> marriage and two children being born. And then, of course, uh, among those five would be meeting Jeff and Sumera. It's, uh, it's been fantastic ever since working with them. Um, so this is just basically, for example, how to do the, the also way of teaching how to manage uh, postpartum bleeding. Uh, it has to be very structured. You have to be more people than one to deal with the emergency. You have to deal with the, of course, you have to call for help. You have to stop the accident, stop the bleeding, give this and these drugs, give resuscitation with fluids. And Nathan has been tortured uh, through this in, in Rwanda just recently. But it's the same thing we're doing, um, trying to keep it very uh, simple. Um, this is what you do. This is, um, it looks like, I can't see, it's, it's a mid young midwife from Bukova. It's just doing the bimanual compression. They did not know how to perform this skill. But this is like very basic. If you have a heavy bleeding, this is what you do. And uh, we use the mannequins instead of real patients. Um, but she, I don't know if she's, she's screaming very loud. It's uh, like, but she's really using a lot of force. and. Um, this is like the vacuum delivery if uh, a child is not coming out. Uh, in some instances, you could do a vacuum delivery instead of the cesarean section. And cesarean sections in Africa are not as safe as they are here. Problems of anesthesia and of uh, infections and things like that. Uh, so uh, they did not do vacuum delivery, even though they had the equipment at this hospital. And I've seen that in many settings in, in Tanzania even though it's one of the basic signal functions of emergency obstetric care. Uh, so we kind of taught that. Uh, this is Pendum Lai from KCMC. He's now the head of also in Tanzania. And uh, this is shoulder dystocia. If the head is out, the shoulder is not coming, what do you do? You have to do certain maneuvers to get the baby out, neonatal resuscitation. 
and uh, it was great during the course. Uh, until then, the, the, the staff at the hospital had been a bit suspicious about me. I was there from, from the Ministry of Health to kind of report any errors they were doing. And I was not sure that they were going to show up for the course, but they came. Even though we did not pay them allowances or anything, it was they actually came to the course and they were overwhelmingly positive about it afterwards. And it was just totally different the time after the, the course. Uh, they kind of knew it was a good way to end. Uh, instead of being like criticizing and things like that, it was very good to have something to have done together. And like, so we ended on a positive note. And I think that was. Uh, real turning point in the, my view on doing uh, this kind of work in, 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 in the developing world con context. So what the study showed that there was actually a huge impact on some of the uh, maternal mobility. I had only seven weeks data collection after the, the, uh, the training, so I could not really say anything about maternal mortality. But postpartum hemorrhage was actually much more uh, common that we had thought it was one out of three women that bled one, more than half a liter of blood. That is the definition of excessive bleeding after birth. After the course, we've reduced that incidence to half. Severe bleeding, that is when it's starting to become dangerous. It's like a bleeding more than one liter. It was one in 11 of those women that gave birth, normal vaginal birth at this hospital, who bled more than a liter. And that was reduced also by 50%. It was highly significant. You could also see that the skills improved. You could prevent postpartum hemorrhage by administering by very simple measures, by giving a drug called oxytocin that helps the uterus to contract. You should give that as soon as the baby is out. And we could see that the oxytocin after the, the course was given at an earlier point after the delivery of um, the baby. And that could be one reason why the incidence of PPH was reduced. You could also see one thing that was very striking was that before the course, the, the midwives at the labor ward only identified 4% of those women who had excessive bleeding. The, it's very difficult if you spread out blood on the table, how much is that? It's, it's very difficult. Nobody nobody knows. So that's, we, we can see that everywhere. It's difficult visually to estimate bleeding amount. So there was, there was a severe underestimation of bleeding amount. After the birth, we did like some kind of a ketchup quiz. We threw out some ketchup in a, in a conga and then they had to kind of guess, and there was a piece of chocolate for the winner. And that was a kind of <laughs> encouraging them to know. After the course, they were kind of identifying as, much, as many as 20% of women having bleeding, but still severely underestimating bleeding amount. You could see that the skills improved. They would more often do uterus massage to help the uterus contract. If there was a manifest uh, bleeding, they uh, more often used the drugs to uh, to uh, help the uterus contract, and they also did this by manual compression quite often after the um, uh, after this intervention. It was actually in 25% of the women with the uh, postpartum hemorrhage that had this by manual compression performed. Looking at the, the newborns, just some very, uh, yeah. This, this was where the, the newborn babies were, were put after the birth in almost in, in 19 out of 20 cases. Babies are best for their mother, skin to skin, because then they have a better thermal regulation and they maybe start breastfeeding early, so they inflate their lungs and the mother produces oxytocin, so the uterus contracts. But they were, for some reason, put under this heater for hours, even though this poster said, put the baby to the mother, skin to skin, as soon as possible, start breastfeeding. And nobody could tell me why. Why do you do this? And then I didn't have the explanation, but actually we could see that we could change that practice, very, very basic. It's like 6% before the course were with their mother within 10 minutes. It was 72% after the course. There was no change in the stillbirth rate and the neonatal resuscitation was not performed more often. Maybe it was better, I don't know. But we could see this is like an underpowered study to say anything about neonatal, uh, early neonatal mortality, but there was actually a decline from 6 in 550 deliveries, six uh, live-born baby, uh, babies that died before discharge, before we did the course, and there were none after. It's borderline significant with a p-value of 0 0.048 or something. I don't know, the study said I cannot tell about it was something with this early skin-to-skin -skin contact, but I think the message is that actually it's very simple. Um, messages uh, uh, can make a, a change. 
um, what was not changed because some of the, the training did not seem to work was the management of prolonged labor that women lie in labor for too long. We had the same rate of cesarean sections and uh, still many of the cesarean sections were on a poor indication and uh, also delayed and they did still not do this vacuum delivery. And that was like, ah, they gave you these bad new vacuums to teach you what happens. So that was like, but that didn't work and we had to look into what is it that in this setting doesn't work. I know in other uh, places it has been, uh, we have seen an increase in vacuum births after the altar courses in, uh, in our Latin America. Um, but actually when I got back this summer, it, they had started using vacuums and that was the new also, we, we did train some local midwives and doctors to become altar instructors uh, also here in Bukoba. Uh, and they actually, the instructors started, because they were kind of advocates for, for this emergency obstetric care, and they started using a vacuum. So usually it's only doctors who does it. So I was happy. It was not, they hadn't performed many vacuum deliveries, but it was a significant increase anyway. Um, you could see the maternal mortality was declining, and this has actually remained uh, like 40, 50% reduced in the years after the auto training. I don't think it's only the training. I think it was because there was a new medical officer in charge. The one who did not recognize any problems was uh, replaced by a consultant in OPGYN and he we've been working very close with him and he's uh, on a day-to-day -day basis has been trying to improve emergency obstetric care. Um, so the conclusion of the intervention study is that emergency obstetric care training can, when adapted thoroughly to the setting, uh, improve the uh, quality of staff skills and reduce at least maternal mobility. I think guidelines need to be kind of structured and simple and to the point. If you overload this kind of information, if you give information on very complicated things, people would forget the important points. So it's better to give a few basic messages that are really important uh, than giving tons and tons of uh, information. But there's a need to do much more research into this. It's very little investigated. But what happened after is like, uh, I think often when you work with development health issues, it's very, dis you get disillusioned uh, every second day and it's kind of oh, it's not working and uh, things end up in corruption and it's just like, but I think actually we, uh, Samara and Jeff established the uh, also program in, in, in Moshi uh, after the first courses up here in Bukoba and have been doing a fantastic job uh, and not only the also, they've been doing different reproductive health, uh, fantastic things up there and we have been, we have a um, uh, like 25 instructors in, in, in Tanzania now. We've been doing, I think, 26 courses and more than 600 providers are trained. And I think uh, everywhere we go, people are, uh, are happy to have this course. It's only two days, so it's kind of cost effective. And it's, um, and it's um, doing this is kind of keeping me happy working with the developing, in the developing world. And I think actually this is something that could make a difference. And I, I think the Duke program there is fantastic. And we have plans uh, for other um, programs uh, trying to do pre-graduate training. Uh, one thing is that you could train health providers once they are starting to work, but you have to take them out of work. It would probably be more cost effective to do a pre-graduate training, and that's uh, what we just did, uh, Nathan and Jeff uh, and I, uh, in Rwanda just last week uh, at the last year medical students um, at National University of Rwanda. We did the, the also course up there, and hopefully that will be something that is continuing in the future. Um, we also try to adapt the course to meet the, 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 the uh, to be as close to the, the courses of maternal mortality. This is, we, we, we thought we needed like a workstation on the post-abortion care. We did not really have one, but we tried to, to do this uh, manual vacuum aspiration. We did not have, what we don't use patients in the altar course, so we use papaya fruits instead, mm -hmm. something adapted from an American uh, workstation. It was okay, but not really working well, and I don't know if he didn't find the right ripeness of papaya fruits <laughs> or what it was, but but I think it's just to, just to say that I think we, are, we need to also adapt the course. Um, instead of the CTG, like the continuous uh, electronic field monitoring of the baby that we have in the States and in Europe uh, to see how the fetal heart rate is. Um, that's, that, that's science fiction to talk about that in the setting where we are working because it's, uh, they don't have the machinery and it's kind of... So we wanted to talk about the part of graph that is like a graphical 
uh, representation of, of how vapor is uh, proceeding, is it going fast enough, and we have you know, the fetal heart rate is in the right range, and how is the amniotic fluid, how good are the contractions, and et cetera, et cetera. It's a very good tool. There's no evidence that it's working, but it kind of introduced the workstation in this instead. And um, yeah. So, um, still working, and a uh, lot of need to collect more evidence. Um, I think the main message, uh, what I've uh, learned to this, uh, these last three or four years, was that maternal mortality can actually be reduced, but you need to strengthen the health systems. It's not mainly community interventions. Of course, there's something about uh, uh, reducing fertility rates, things like that. That that is and that is almost cost-free. If you do that, you will reduce the cost in the rest of the health system. Um, but I think you also have to look into quality assurance of emergency obstetric care. That is very, very central. And skills and knowledge of health providers must be addressed. It's probably quite easy. I think it's one of the low-hanging fruits. It's, it's not uh, very uh, expensive, but we need much more research <coughs> into quality assurance, into uh, skills uh, training. And this is a not just just something that uh, Sumira and Jeff and I are saying. This has actually been demonstrated. All the places where they have reduced maternal mortality, they have really had focus on strengthening uh, emergency obstetric care and health uh, uh, systems. And this is from Southeast Asia, that where they've reduced um, maternal mortality in, uh, very impressively in Sri Lanka, and Malaysia, and Thailand by almost like 90% over the last, uh, yeah. 30, 40 years, and they had a strong political commitment to do something about maternal mortality and uh, strengthen the health facilities. One example is from a region south of Kagera region in Kikoma region in Tanzania. They did a low cost or no cost intervention at the regional hospital. Just having this maternal death hold is improving the skills of providers, uh, making guidelines for how to manage complications. They reduced maternal mortality over a few years by 75%. Um, so this is like, I think there is general agreement that it is possible to reduce maternal mortality and that you have to look into health systems. So we're also trying to do um, advocacy. This is like some of the uh, also instructors in Tanzania. We're trying to, to spread this message. We're trying to work with the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. It's difficult. We're, until now, we haven't managed to convince them. They have a three weeks uh, life-saving skills course. It's very expensive. It's a very outdated manual they're using, and it's uh, and the course is very popular because uh, you get a lot of nights attending the course. So most of the, those, I've seen like some of those attending the three weeks course would not even deal with their childbirth. It would just be friends of those uh, sending people on the courses because it's like they get a week salary in one day uh, attending a course. So, so. But we're still working and one day we might manage to convince the Ministry of Health. In uh, Denmark, I've been had, had the uh, opportunity to meet the, this is a Danish crown princess in a very nice uh, white uh, fashion jacket. This is the Minister of Development Aid from, from Denmark. And I was invited to the National Un uh, Museum of Art at a Mother's Day event to, to show them this uh, also postpartum hemorrhage workstation. And I was closely instructed I should not uh, involve the princess in anything, I should not bring any gadgets, things like that, but I managed to sneak in some theater blood and we did this work <laughs> station. And then we had this baby delivered and I actually just in a confusion had to hand it over to somebody and I gave it to the crown princess and I was just, oh my God, maybe she's gonna have stains on her, her nice coat, but she did. But this was like, we managed to get the minister laughing and get a press photo so we kind of drew some attention to, to that. And uh, last year for the Mother's Day event, I was arranging a, a meeting at the University of Copenhagen with the rector and the new Minister of Development Aid, uh, aid and the Crown Princess, by surprise, came again. And these are my two daughters giving the flowers to the Crown Princess and that saved uh, my marriage, I think, because my wife suddenly started to uh, back up what I was doing because it's she's very royal, so it's like, uh, no, but this just, uh, not to uh, show more family photos, but the Crown Princess is actually a uh, very strong advocate for maternal uh, health in uh, Denmark, uh, and uh, she's now the protector of UNFPA uh, maternal health program, and that is, uh, but it's a lot of work, and sometimes it's fun, and sometimes it's just so, ah, we're moving nowhere, but it's, uh, but we are trying our best to, 
to send the message that you can reduce maternal mortality. It's worth working in this area.